Welcome to a discussion of radical fundamental principles of freedom, rational self-interest, laissez-faire capitalism, and individual rights. The Yaron Brook Show starts now. So imagine uh, walking down a street with, with hundreds of other people and, um, you know, you're just with your family and your kids and your wife and... Uh, Boyfriend, girlfriend, whatever, hundreds of people around, shops and everything, you know, mosing around, sitting at coffee shops and whatever. And suddenly, a car comes speeding down, zigzagging to try to hit as many people as possible. Bodies spewing all over the place, blood everywhere, people screaming, screeching, yelling. Well, that's what you would have experienced if you were in Barcelona on, on the main avenue, the main tourist avenue of Barcelona uh, last week uh, when a, uh, a jihadi um, in a red van drove down the street killing, I think the latest number is 14, but it's still growing because some, some of the injured are, are really injured. Um, killing 14, uh, wounding uh, over 100 uh, wounding over 100. And, you know, this was nothing as compared to what they actually planned. Uh, it, it turns out that these uh, Islamists, these jihadis, were building bombs, um, had hundreds of uh, gas canisters that they were hoping to explode and to kill many, many more people, hundreds, maybe thousands of people. Um they, uh, they like, fortunately for us, uh, most terrorists are, uh, they were pathetic at what they were trying to do and, and uh, turned out to be unsuccessful and landed up uh, blowing themselves up uh, in the process. So uh, the night before this van, uh, uh, you know, careened through the street, uh, the, uh, the apartment in which these... Uh, these or the the house in which these uh, terrorists were building their bombs uh, blew up, probably because of their mishandling of uh, of the explosives. So luckily for us, and this is something I've learned firsthand. Luckily for us, uh, uh, terrorists, bad guys, but particularly terrorists, particularly jihadis, are just almost always incompetent and stupid and idiots. Indeed, even nine eleven could have been easily stopped if, if if FBI and CIA had been more alert. Uh, that is, it is not the genius of the terrorists that made 9-11 possible, but in some sense is the incompetence of, of those who were, who whose job it is to catch them and to stop them. But in this case, what really stopped them from killing many, many more people was the fact that uh, their house blew up because they mishandled explosives. And then because they were still committed to acts of terrorism, they figured on taking a low-tech device, a van, and plowing through people and trying to kill as many people. And that was in Barcelona. And then the following morning, is my understanding, or so maybe later that night, uh, the same thing was, was tried in a different town uh, south of Barcelona and where a bunch of the terrorists, five of the terrorists, I think, were killed, uh, trying to do the same thing, run through people because their bombs had exploded. Um, one other uh, element that I think is connected and I think we'll find is connected, although the evidence is still not clear on this, or it, 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 there's no proof of it, is that in Finland, a, uh, a Moroccan uh, man who uh, was seeking asylum in Finland, by the way, all the assailants in, uh, in the Spanish attack, in Barcelona attack, were all uh, Moroccan uh, Migrants into uh, Spain. Some of them uh, might have been born in Spain, but they, they were all originally from Morocco. The guy in Finland was from Morocco, which leads me to believe, and I think many others believe, that uh, there was a connection. Uh, you know, they probably all were, were, were part of the same, probably all cousins or friends or whatever, and had decided to attack. Uh, the, the guy in Finland, less sophisticated maybe than the people in uh, Barcelona, decided to use a knife. Uh, went on a knifing uh, rampage in uh, in Western Finland, uh, killed two people, wounded five. Uh, just horrible. Just you know, imagine a, a, a man running at you with a knife, you know, trying to stab you. And and uh, this uh, this attacker, 
attacked only women. This is a cowardly thing for you. I mean, you know, attacked only women and, and stabbed, indeed, the two deaths of two women, one young, one old. Um, they don't discriminate by age, but he certainly didn't want to go up against a man, I guess. Uh, women are more offensive in the Western countries because of how they dress and how they behave. Uh, God forbid it's better just to kill them. Um, it's just horrible. It's just, it's just the horror of it, of, of just, just being in the street and suddenly somebody just lunging at you with a knife or suddenly lunging at you with an automobile. Just, just try to place yourself in that context because there were some Americans in Barcelona among among the dead, I think at this point, two, one young child and one uh, one uh, man on his uh, on his honeymoon on his uh, I guess one year anniversary delayed honeymoon, and he was killed when he was separated. He was going to the bathroom. His wife stay, uh, stayed uh, near a souvenir shop, and he, he was killed. She luckily, you know, was pushed into the souvenir shop and survived. Now you know all this. I have to admit, kind of brings me back to to my childhood because as bad as things are today uh, in Europe and in uh, in uh, you know to some extent in the U.S., although uh, terrorism is not a big threat in the U.S. right now, um, as bad as things are in Europe, things were much worse uh, in the 1970s. It's just a it's an interesting t- statistic. In the 1970s, there were many many more terrorist attacks. In Europe, many more people died as a consequence of terrorist attacks in Europe. Um, it, there were there were a number of different uh, factions uh, committing those terrorist attacks. There was uh, there was the PLO, so the Palestinians, uh, secular in those days, secular Palestinians, not in the name of Allah, but in the name of uh, Palestinian nationalism. There was the um, IRA, the Irish Republican Army. Um, that was committed huge number of, of bombings and killings in all over in England and in Ireland, but also in other places. Uh, and then in Europe, people forget this, but in Europe, there were uh, there was the uh, uh, Biden. If I get this right, and I don't have it written in front of me, so this is out of memory. Biden Meinhof, I think, was the group, uh, and many many other uh, the Red Brigade and many many other. Uh, Marxist groups that were basically slaughtering people all over Europe, uh, you know, bombings, uh, attacks, uh, uh, kidnappings in Germany, in France, Italy was a big, big location for this. And if you look at just sheer numbers, numbers of terrorist attacks and numbers of casualties, far greater, far greater than anything we experience today, even in Western Europe, um, as a consequence. So, uh, you know, just just horrific. Um, the 1970s, in many, many, many respects, um, we could go on. Uh, horrific times, really, really dark times for, for, West, for the West and for the United States. And it looked like the world was really going to end. And, uh, you know, Marxism was on the rise. These Marxist organizations got support politically. There were communist parties, like in Italy, who almost won elections. Uh, and uh, it, 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 it was everywhere. So, so one, I think it's important for us to put in perspective what's going on today with what, what was going on back then. And, and, and back then, by the way, these terrorist organizations w- were gaining uh, government support. They got government support from the Soviet Union. So they're all the leftist terrorists, and, and for those who think that leftists are not terrorists or, or have not been terrorists, uh, the 1970s are proof to the extent to which they are, never mind the... Antifa and other terrorists, leftist terrorists that exist today in the United States. But, but those are, you know, real, in quotes, terrorist organizations in the sense that we're really bombing and killing and, and kidnapping and really, you know, causing havoc in, in much of Western Europe. And um, so it's important to put in perspective that this was much worse back then. It was state-funded. The Soviet Union was funding it all. By the way, the Soviet Union was also funding the IRA. And it wasn't just the Soviet Union. It turns out that Muslim countries like Libya's Gaddafi was funding the IRA, and indeed there were training camps in Libya and in other Arab countries where both the PLO and uh, the IRA were, were training together, and some of these Marxist groups were all training together. The PLO, by the way, was a, was a, a leftist uh, terrorist organization. It was secular with clearly Marxist uh, agenda, and the more radical 
among the Palestinians, who were more violent even than the PLO, were even more uh, more uh, Marxist and more leftist. In, in those days, the primary source of terrorist activities in 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 the Western world, at least, was was not Islam. It, it, it was a Marxism. It was a leftist ideology. All right. Uh, we're going to take a short break here. Uh, when we get back, tell you a little bit about my personal experiences with terrorism. I grew up really in an environment um, where terrorism was all around. So I want to tell you a little bit about that, a little bit about how to put this in perspective. Then I want to talk about how we beat terrorists and how, how, how we can defeat terrorism. All right. You're listening to your Ron Brooks show on the Blaze Radio Network. We will be back after this break. <laughs> Listening to the Iran Brooks Show on the Blaze Radio Network. All right, so we're talking terrorism today, and we're talking about uh, what happened in Spain last week. Obviously, uh, put it a little bit in perspective in terms of uh, where we've been uh, in the history of terrorism. Uh, terrorism, of course, goes back in the West, in the Western world, way back to the 19th century, even. Um, you know, I want to talk a little bit about what it was like growing up in uh, in Israel, uh, surrounded by terrorism uh, as well. But, but, and then I want to talk about, I really want to get into uh, why, why we tolerate at least this round of terrorism, which I think is solvable and, and, and uh, addressable. And I think in, in, in potential reality, much more dangerous, much more dangerous than uh, previous rounds of terrorism uh, b because primarily of our weakness, what should be done, how it could be done, how we win, um, what it would take to win, and why why we're not doing any of it. I, I don't think there's any doubt that people know how to win this war, how to reduce terrorism. Maybe you can't eliminate it completely, but you certainly can reduce it, and yet we're not doing what's necessary. Um, so, uh, you know, we'll talk about that. Also, we'll put it in perspective in terms of pre-9-11, post-9-11, and, and what's happened. You've definitely seen a, an increase in terrorism since 2011, since... Uh, uh, for the last five years, uh, so but again, relative to the 1970s, if you particularly if you take out 9/11, if you take out just the sheer number of casualties in 9/11, you can see a, a dramatic down uh, a path in terms of uh, in terms of the uh, the number of terrorists. Now, if you want to get in on a conversation, um, you can call in 888 -900 -3393, 888-900 three three nine three um look i grew up i grew up in israel uh many of you know this some of you don't probably i was born in the in the early 1960s in in israel and uh, uh spent 60s 70s and 80s uh in in israel uh and particularly i'd say in the 70s this was a period of of intense terrorist activity in Israel constantly, not, not, not as bad as what it was in the early 2000s, but suddenly uh, ho horrific, you know, whether it was, uh, you know, so, so I remember, I remember, uh, first of all, as a kid growing up, you were taught, told things like, don't pick up pens or, or anything from, from the street, from, 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 because the terrorists would put little explosives in them and you, you would pick them up and they would blow your hand off and things like that. So you just avoided that. When you were riding your bicycle, you didn't ride over obstacles. Like, I don't know if there was a, it was a cardboard on the, on the pavement or stuff like that. You didn't ride over it because you didn't know what was under it. It could be an ex, in, ex, explosive and it could be something that was dangerous. So you just avoided doing that. So little things like that. Um, and yet, you know, we kind of grew up. It, it didn't prevent us from riding our bicycles. It didn't prevent us from living. It didn't play, prevent us from playing. I, indeed, I spend more time outside uh, than, uh, than my kids probably certainly did. And most kids do today. Uh, we, weren't, uh, we, we weren't afraid, in a sense. It was kind of, unfortunately, unfortunately, it was part of the world we lived, we lived with. We just lived with it. Um, I remember 1972, sitting by the radio. Uh, listening as the commentators described what was happening during the Munich uh, Olympics when uh, Palestinian terrorists took the uh, you know hostages, the Israeli athletes, and ultimately butchered them all. 
Uh, I remember sitting by the radio listening. In those days, uh, television was very limited. We had one channel in Israel, and it was only in the evenings, and you didn't, you didn't have 24-hour news. So you, you, you listened to the radio. Sitting by the radio, listening to reports of kids about my age having been taken hostage by Palestinians and later on killed, slaughtered by them in northern Israel while hiking. Uh, the outcome of that was when we went hiking, uh, we took weapons with us. Now, the weapons we took would have not been, I don't think we would have been able to face up to any, uh, any Palestinian terrorists. We were 16, 17-year-olds with old you know, rifles. But hey, it didn't stop us from hiking. It didn't stop us from living. It didn't stop us from going out there and doing stuff. But it made us very aware. It made us very aware of the risks. It made us very aware of the value of human life. It made us very aware that life was precious. And, and, and we grew up fast. We grew up fast. You had no choice but because it was everywhere. You were constantly under threat. We, I used to go hiking in places that, that, that were, were, you know, terrorists had been, um, you didn't stop doing that. You, you, you just, you, you lived with it. And uh, you counted on, unfortunately, uh, counting on your, your political leaders to protect you. Uh, you counted on the police and the military and everybody else to do what was necessary to defend you. And I'd say in those days, Israel was a lot tougher on terrorism than it is today and did a, a better job. Uh, I don't know if you guys remember uh, all the Israeli raids on different places and, and assassinating terrorists all over the world, killing them, uh, in, invading Lebanon in order to rid Lebanon of, of Palestinian terrorists. Un un unfortunately, um, d you know, screwed that up later on, but, but initially crushed them, destroyed them, killed many of them, and, and, and brought about you know, relatively safety to its citizens. Uh, and, you know, I'm, but since then, Israel's been weakened dramatically. Israel doesn't do what is necessary to defend its own citizens anymore. And certainly the U.S. doesn't do what it's necessary, and European countries don't have a clue. But um, why is that? You know, why is it that, that we can't defend ourselves? We, we, we're going to take another break in a, in a couple of minutes and, and talk about that. But, but, but think about it. Look, we've got, we've got terrorism in uh, Europe and the U.S. I, I, terrorism certainly in Europe is is going up not dramatically but it's going up the number of casualties is going up it has been since 2011 and i would argue why 2011 2011 is when syria and then iraq descended into complete anarchy uh 2011 is is when uh you know is is i can't remember the exact date but but around the time that libya as well because of stupid interventions and because of no strategy and because of going in and disrupting places and and uh, and kind of leaving without clearly winning uh we basically created these places uh, in libya in syria one minute and suddenly in iraq where terrorists were allowed to train you know to, to people from all over the world went there to train to be terrorists and we just let it happen we had no strategy around it we we, we had no and this is under obama it, it, all these places were allowed to become havens of terrorist activity. We saw the rise of ISIS as a consequence of all of that. Uh, going back, and this is this, I don't just blame Obama for this. 30. This is Bush. Uh, you know, no strategy, no, no focus on how to win, no focus on what it would take to actually establish 20. peace. Um, so. You know, that's how we got here. We'll talk more about that, and, and we'll talk more about what Bush and Obama did after Ten. this break and, and what we should do and why we're not doing it. You're listening to Ron Brook Show Five. on the Blaze Radio Network. Talking about the horrific events in Barcelona and in Finland, and uh, you know, continuing uh, the, the, these events that started uh, the kind of terrorism, this this idea of driving cars and killing people, has been around for a few years now. I, I think it started with Palestinians in Israel, and uh, has been um, uh, has been escalating in uh, in Europe, in France, uh, 
and in England, obviously, in, 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 uh, on a bridge in London, and now in Barcelona. And, you know, while I think the terrorism, as I said earlier, while the numbers are, are what they are, the numbers are that terrorism has declined from the 1970s, and that uh, the real danger here, in my view, is that if we don't do what's necessary when this enemy is as pathetic as it is, the, the, the jihadi enemy, the uh, jihadi enemy, enemy that we face today, then what is going to happen? What, how are we going to handle when this jihadi enemy has uh, real weapons, like, like potentially a nuclear bomb? What happens when Iran develops a nuclear bomb or when whether North Korea sells one to, you know, Al-Qaeda or ISIS or somebody? What happens when they get real weapons? Um, how, do we, how do we deal with that then? Look at what's happening right now in North Korea. Suggests that once they actually get the nukes, there's very little we're willing or able to do. We can talk about what you can and cannot do with North Korea if you would like. And by the way, you can call in if you have anything on your mind, 888-900-3393. And when they killed 3,000 Americans on 9-11, we did almost nothing. And what we did, as a consequence in my view, has made things much worse, not better. Instead of actually identifying the enemy, instead of crushing the actual enemy, we destabilized the region in an unhealthy way, in a way that only appeased the enemy, in a way that only provided more recruits to the enemy, in a way that only provided more uh, training ground to the enemy. And thus, we have the disaster that is today. And, and we'll get to what I would have done after 9-11 uh, in a little while. But uh, clearly, uh, what we have done in Afghanistan, what we've done in Iraq, what we did in, uh, in um, uh, Libya, and what we haven't done w with what I consider the real enemies is... Um, is partially the reason for why we're seeing uh, these spikes and uh, this increased intensity. And, uh, you know, I think we should be afraid. I mean, I, I, again, I, I think you have to put it in context and you have to remember the context and you have to, and we also should, but we should be afraid because these people are committed to dying and they're committed to killing, they're committing to destroying and they have no fear of using whatever weapon they can find. In Barcelona, they were willing to blow stuff up. Luckily, they blew themselves up first. Luckily, they're idiots. Incompetent idiots. But one of these days, they will be. They'll get lucky. And they'll kill a lot of people. And one of these days, if we're not defending ourselves, they'll get even bigger weapons and worse weapons and kill more people. So I'm not suggesting complacency. I'm not suggesting just accepting it. I'm saying, hey, we got to deal with it. We got to crush the enemy. I'll suggest how we do it in a minute. But also put it in perspective. The end of the world is not here in spite of the eclipse tomorrow. The end of the world is not here. And we can overcome this. We will overcome this in spite of our weakness. We will overcome this. It would be much better much, much better if we actually overcame it in a way that, um, that prevented them, that stopped it now. And I think one way to think about how do you do it, how you can win, is if you think about how the previous bouts of terrorism really were ended or, or slowed down. Uh, with regard to the leftist um, Terrorism. It was really ended when the Soviet Union started opening up under Gorbachev. Funding, to some extent at least, started drying up because they didn't have the money to fund it all. And ultimately, the Berlin Wall came down and the funding disappeared completely. So, a big part of my conclusion, I think, by the way, this is part of what happened with the uh, IRA and why they were willing to compromise and deal with the British is because their training and funding and support from Soviet sources or from Libyan sources or from other sources just dried up. Uh, and and uh, they couldn't raise enough money, I guess, from American rich Irish people to support their terrorist activity. And uh, so they, they landed up cutting a deal. But with regard to 
all these leftist groups, they all collapsed with the wall. They were already in collapse because the funding was already gone. So I think the question to ask ourselves is, who funds these terrorists? What would happen if we somehow stopped that funding? And that, that's question number one. Question number two is, ideologically, who sustains these terrorists? Because remember, the Soviet Union was the model of communist success. It was an empire. It ruled over the, you know, a big chunk of the world. It was, it was expansionary. It was a model for the success of Stalinism. And that inspired Baden Meinhof and many of these other, you know, the Red Brigade. Uh, I, don't, I, I don't know if you remember, there was even a Japanese terror group fighting in the name of Marxism. Uh, it was a famous terrorist attack where they, where, where it was a Japanese who, I think it was in Israel, who, you know, brought guns and just, just killed people, right? So, if you think about, you have to have all these bouts of terrorism, or most of them, unless it's a very localized, like the IRA, or even to some extent, uh, the PLO, though, the, the, as I said, the more violent strands of the PLO are definitely uh, hyper, uh, very much motivated by Marxism. There's usually a driving ideology driven from external force, and there's a funder who is external. There's almost no cases of large-scale terrorism that is not driven by those two factors, money, money, weapons, training, all of that, from an external force, a government of some sort, somewhere, and second, an inspirational ideology that is manifest in some political entity like the Soviet Union. Or, so the question I would ask, if I were trying to deal with jihadism, if I were trying to deal with Islamic terrorism, is those two questions. Where does the money come from? And who provides that inspiration? Who provides the driving ideological force that drives these terrorists? If you can stop the money, and if you can crush the inspiration, the ideological inspiration, you can defeat terrorism. You can defeat this force. You can defeat violent Islamism. You can defeat these jihadists and so on. All right. Um, I'm going to talk about where that, where that inspiration comes from, where the money comes from, uh, and how we defeat this threat after this break. You are listening to the Ron Brook Show on the Blaze Radio Network. Is You're clear. Terry veteran and radical for capitalism. It's the Yaron Brook Show on the Blaze Radio Network. Reform this with Sudi Jasser. Yeah, Care and the Muslim Brotherhood are very good at revising history, declaring what is and what is not Islamic, what is and what is not permitted, what is and what is not free speech to them. Because to them, ideas have rights. Ideas can be good and bad, but they can be prevented according to Care. Reform this on demand. Download episodes at theblaze.com slash radio. SoundCloud, iTunes, and Google Play Music. Paid law attorney spokesperson Adam Pulaski of the Pulaski Law Firm with principal office in Houston, Texas is the attorney responsible for the content of this ad. This ad is not legal advice, and the choice of a lawyer should not be based solely upon advertisement. Services may not be available in all states. Attention Zarelto users. If you or a loved one took Zarelto and suffered a serious bleeding event, you may be entitled to financial compensation. Zarelto is a popular prescription blood thinner used to prevent blood clots and protect patients from strokes. These serious bleeding events have led to numerous cases of hospitalization and even death. Phone lines are open 24-7. Call 800-436-0142. That's 800-436-0142. Have you written a book and want to get it published? Then call Page Publishing at 800-733-9813. Immediately, that's 800-733-9813. Page Publishing is looking for authors of all types of books. And unlike most publishers, Page Publishing will take the time to review each and every book submitted to them and give you their feedback. If they like what they read, they'll get your book into bookstores and for sale online at Amazon, the Apple iTunes, 
iTunes Store, Barnes & Noble, and other outlets. They handle everything. Editing, cover design, copyright protection, printing, publicity, and distribution. So if you've written a novel, children's book, cookbook, inspirational work, poetry, or a biography and want to get it published, then you need to call Page Publishing and do it immediately. Call 800-733-9813 now for your free author submission kit. Again, for your free author submission kit, call 800-733-9813. That's 800-733-9813. Your road to fame and fortune could very well start with this simple phone call. Call Page Publishing at 800-733-9813 for your free author submission kit. Late nights on the blaze, the wonderful world of stew is getting sexy. Me? Sexy? All the adult content that's too hot for prime time. I'm pretty sure these are the exact same episodes that have already aired. It's explicit. Do we really have to oversell it like this? The sexy world of stew. No, it's the wonderful world of stew. Oh yeah, Sunday through Thursday at 1 a.m. Eastern on The Blaze. If your credit card bills have gotten out of hand, call Consolidated Credit now. If you're making the minimum payments, but your balance is just not going down, call Consolidated Credit now. If the interest rates on your credit cards are so high, it will take years to get out of debt, call Consolidated Credit now. 800-294-1788. They've helped over 5 million people with credit card debt. They can consolidate your debts into one lower payment, reduce your interest rates, and get you out of debt fast. If you're struggling with credit card debt, Consolidated Credit Programs will teach you how to get out and stay out of debt. Call 800-294-1788. 800-294-1788. That's 800-294-1788. Consolidated Credit Counseling Services Incorporated, 5701 West Sunrise Boulevard, Fort Lauderdale, Florida, 33313. Not a loan company. Licensed by the New York Department of Financial Services or by the Vermont Department of Financial Regulation. Maryland DM19, Oregon DM80031. Services are primarily educational in nature. Are you worried about your mom or dad living alone in their house? Hi, I'm Joan London. Listen, I know how difficult it is to find senior care for someone you love. That's why I recommend a free service called A Place for Mom. They are the nation's largest senior living referral service. Call A Place for Mom today. To receive free information on senior living communities in your area, call A Place for Mom at 1-800-803-6951. A Place for Mom offers free one-on-one advice from local advisors and a personalized list of senior living communities you can visit. If you have questions about senior care for your mom or dad, there's a place for answers, a place for mom. Call A Place for Mom in the next 10 minutes to get your free ebook on financing senior care as well as free information on senior living communities in your area. Call 1-800-803-6951. That's 1-800-803-6951. Come back in 30. Go Pelka. Starting Monday at noon Eastern, we are going to be talking about the eclipse, of course. Yes, we'll cover any of the breaking news from the weekend, but you have to put on those protective glasses, get that lead-lined suit, and let's face Magnetic North as we get ready to chronicle the solar eclipse. Join us, won't you? Pure Opelka on the Blaze Radio Network. This is the Yaron Brook Show. All right, you're listening to Yaron Brook Show, and uh, I, I want to give you the good news. If you enjoy the show, there's a lot of this show coming your way this coming week. So uh, I am actually going to be filling in for uh, Opelka uh, on Tuesday, Wednesday, and Thursday. That means three hours every day, Tuesday, Wednesday, and Thursday, you know, assuming the world is still around after the eclipse. Um, and that is uh, from 9 a.m. to 12, a.m., 12 p.m. every day, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday. Uh, Yaron Brook will be filling in for Michael Pelka. So we'll see. Uh, I'll see what it's like to be a real radio talk show host doing three hours a day. Uh, I, I'm, I'm, I'm looking forward to it. I'm, this, you, can, you can consider this Sunday show just training in anticipation. But hopefully you'll listen in. Uh, maybe open up that Facebook window or, or, or the, uh, the, the open up the Blaze radio while you're at work. Put on those headphones. Nobody knows what you're listening to. And uh, 9 to 12 uh, Pacific time, uh, 12 to 3 East Coast time, 
Um, you know, hopefully, uh, hopefully uh, all of you guys will have the opportunity to listen. Nine hours of the Iran Brooks show during the week. Uh, I'm excited. I hope you are too. All right, before, before I get to my strategy for winning, and I know I'm dragging this out, and you're just going to have to be patient with me today. I want to I, I make clear that I do not believe the U.S. has any, any strategy to winning. Nothing. We have been in Afghanistan for almost 16 years, and we don't know what we're doing. And I would argue we didn't know what we were doing when we went there. And there hasn't been a day since then that we've known what we're doing. George W. Bush had this um, theory that if the United States just invaded these countries, beat up some bad guys, and told them to become democratic, then that spirit of freedom that is in everybody's hearts, as he told us, would, would, would they, you know, that would shine through and they would ultimately bring about these wonderful democratic havens. Didn't happen. Surprise, surprise. Same thing in, in Iraq. What was the strategy? We took him over. We killed Saddam Hussein. And then the Iraqis would rise up in joy and establish a Western-like pro-individual rights democracy in Iraq. No. We should have known that going in. So at least I'd say this. At least Bush had a strategy, a bad strategy, a stupid strategy, right? An irrational strategy, if you understand history, and you have any sense of ideas and what it takes to get to the point civilizationally, from a civilization perspective, of freedom, of individual rights, of you know modern Western democracies, right? Which are far better than an alternative, although flawed in and of themselves. But he had no clue. But at least he had an idea. He had a strategy. Since then, Obama had no strategy other than to lead from behind, which means disengage, but not really. Lead, but not really. You know, uh, uh, so attack Libya again with no, no strategy, no idea what we're going to do afterwards, nothing, and, and of course not lead the effort against Libya. I think we should have just left Libya alone. Um, kind of wasn't sure about what to do with Syria, mostly left it alone, probably a good thing. Um, Iraq left and went back in with a little bit, but not too much. No strategy. And then Afghanistan was a complete disaster. Surge, decline, surge, decline. No strategy anywhere in our so-called war on terror. No identification of the ideology. At least Trump, I mean, Trump has no strategy. I mean, we'll see in the next few days he's going to announce his new Afghanistan strategy. I, I, I will predict it will be not strategic. It will be completely tactical. It will be meaningless. It will, it will, it will lead to nothing. That is my prediction. Uh, everybody says there's a strategy. General Mathis says there's a strategy. Um, but, but there's no strategy. And there will be no strategy. Because th these people are clueless when it comes to they don't have what it takes to define a proper strategy and then execute on it. Uh, so there is no strategy. None of these, none of these presidents, none of these generals have had a strategy since 9/11 or, or before that, since uh, since the, the the 80s, since this this threat of jihadism rose up. Really, November 4th, 1979, when our embassy in Tehran was taken, which was the initial uh, shot in this war between modern jihadis and uh, in the United States of America and, and the rest of the West. This is what a strategy has to do and what they won't do, but this is what they have to do. One, identify the enemy. Call it by name. Now, Trump has made strides in that direction. I'll give him credit for that. It completely emotionalistically never really explains it, and nothing he has done suggests that he understands what it means. But he at least is willing to name them. He at least is willing to say, right? It's affiliated with religion. It's affiliated with Islam, right? So he calls them Islamic whatever, right? So first name them. Islamic totalitarians or jihadis. Start with that. Then ask the question. Where does their funding come from? 
One Who gives them the money? Second question, or third question. Who are the regimes that both best represent this ideology? That, that, they, I, that people, people who, who, who want to believe in this ideology look up to and say, oh, I wanna, we want to be like them. They were already successful at this. We can be. We can do it. We can win. What are those regimes? And then go to war with the funders Dirty. and with the spiritual supporters, the people who make these terrorist organizations possible. That's how you win. That's the only strategy Ten. that can work. Now, we're going to take a break uh, through the top of the hour. When we get back, we're going to put some names to this. We're going to talk about what exactly needs to be done and how it should be done Applying and the why we would actually self-interest. Welcome to a discussion of radical fundamental principles of freedom, rational self-interest, laissez-faire capitalism, and individual rights. The Yaron Brook Show starts now. All right, so we're talking today about terrorism, the terrorist attack in Barcelona, but the general trend towards of, of Islamic terrorism on the rise. Uh, you know, most Islamic terrorism, if you look at the numbers in terms of casualties and in, in, in terms of events, actually happen in Muslim countries. Hundreds, thousands of people die every year in Iraq, in Afghanistan, in in Nigeria, in in a variety of different countries, Somalia, you know, a variety of different countries all over the world, primarily Muslim versus Muslim kind of uh, kind of terrorist attacks, uh, and and uh, luckily, luckily for us, and because I think it's luck, I, I think to some extent it's the, it's the ability of our uh, security forces, uh, particularly our intelligence agencies. But luckily for us, the number of actual terrorist attacks in the United States and in the Western world is relatively small, and the number of casualties is relatively low. It's greater than zero, which is more than it should be, but it's relatively small. As I said, terrorism was much more of a problem in the 1970s with regard to the number of events and the number of casualties, and it's still pretty rare. It, 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 it's, it's pretty freaky to be, to be caught up in a terrorist act in anywhere in the Western world. Doesn't mean we should be complacent. Doesn't mean we should just leave it alone. And of course, it's not just terrorism. There is a, the, the, these Islamists have a p political agenda in addition to a military, if you will, agenda. Uh, but, but, you know, it could be stopped. It could be primarily stopped. The, the terrorism could be stopped. So let's, let's take the questions I left you with last time. Um, what is, what is the ideology? We've named it. Uh, it's a totalitarian Islam or, or uh, um, uh, you know, jihadists or Islamists. It, it, it has to have Islam in the name. It has to be related to Islam without lumping in all Muslims and the whole of the Islamic religion because that does not help you when it comes to actually identifying your enemies and, and, and crushing them. Second, second. Now, Islam is a philosophical enemy, but political enemy, you have to identify political entities. Who is ruled by this ideology? Who funds this ideology? Who promotes this ideology? Who inspires this ideology? Really, there are only two countries in the world who do this. Now, there are other small ones, but two significant ones. that are the big players in this space. One is Iran. Iran is the largest fund of terrorism in the world. It is the inspiration politically for most Islamic terrorist ideologies. It, its revolution in 1979, the rise of Ayatollah Khomeini and the establishment of a Sharia law-based system, theocracy in Iran, inspired uh, uh, groups from, from Northern Africa to Indonesia and Malaysia, inspired people everywhere. When you read the literature, the Islamist literature, what they write about themselves, 1979 plays a huge role because it proved to them that the West could be defeated. It proved to them that they could get rid of their secular dictators and replace them with Sharia-based law. It proved to them that nobody would stop them. And the continuous existence of Iran as a theocracy proves to them every day that this is possible. It's possible to have a Sharia-based government, a theocracy, 
and for it to be, quote, successful. And they aspire to bring that ideology everywhere. Now, Iran is Shiite. And we're not going to get into the difference between Shiite and Sunni. Look it up. Iran is Shiite, but they have never held back from supporting financially, ideologically, materially, spiritually, Sunni terrorist organizations. Whether their support for Hamas, which is primarily Sunni, whether their support for Al-Qaeda, which we know they were very supportive of pre-9-11 and post-9-11. And right now, the latest stories I'm reading about uh, Afghanistan is that Iran has become one of the main supporters of the Taliban in Afghanistan because they, they think that they can get along with the Taliban in the end of the day. They have the same basic ideology, Sharia, and, and the forcing of Sharia on the population rather than the regular, relatively, and this is very relatively, secular regime in, in, uh, in uh, Kabul today. They also prefer the Taliban to ISIS. So they are supportive of the Taliban and fighting ISIS. One, one of the best things is when they start fighting among each other, but it doesn't happen often enough and we don't support it uh, vigorously enough. So they're supporting the Taliban, even though the Taliban are Sunni. So the separation of Sunni-Shiite, not as important as many might think, at least not in the grand scheme of things. And some local levels, like in Iraq, it's very important, but in the grand scheme, it doesn't matter. Iran is the inspiration, the funding, it's everything. As long as Iran is ruled as a theocracy, these terrorists will continue. So that's country number one. Country number two is Saudi Arabia. Yeah, a friend, Saudi Arabia. The country our president just visited. A country in which our president just danced with the sheiks who are on the side funding much of this terrorist activity. Now, maybe it's not the top of the royal family. Maybe it's only the middle of the royal family. Royal family is huge. Maybe it's just the charities. Maybe it's not official government policy, but there's no question whatsoever that Saudi Arabia is funding radical mosques, radical schools, madrasas all over the world in Wahhabi ideology, the ideology of, of, of raising weapons and, and fighting the enemy in the West, fighting America, fighting. I, I mean, I wouldn't be surprised if, the, if it turns out that the sheik the, who radicalized these young Moroccan men in Spain, and they were all radicalized by a particular sheik, it appears, was funded ultimately by the Saudis or by some convoluted route was funded by the Saudis. That's, you know, they have the money. And, and they have a deal with the Wahhabis. You take care of the spiritual, leave us to rule. And the Wahhabis say, okay, we'll take care of the spiritual, we'll export it all over the world. And they do. So this funding is everywhere. And of course, here's Saudi Arabia. Funding terrorism, there's no question elements within Saudi intelligence and Saudi war family were involved in 9-11. We know that from the redacted pages from the, from the House Committee meetings. I, I, again, and yet, they're our best friends. So what does that tell Muslims all over the world? It tells them the West is pathetic. It tells them the West is afraid. It tells them that, 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 that Saudi Arabia and Iran have, the, have, have control over the West, that the West won't challenge them, that it is, you can stand up to the West and survive and actually thrive and do well. It tells them they shouldn't be afraid of the West because the West is nothing. They are emboldened by our weakness. We are a paper tiger. And if you don't believe me, read, read some of what Osama bin Laden was writing. And he was writing about the West's weakness and how he thought if, if he could have defeated, if he defeated the Soviet Union and Afghanistan, defeating America and the West would be easy because we are so weak. Now, it turned out it wasn't so easy. But that's what drove him, this belief, and it, it, a belief that comes from our appeasement. It's a belief because we won't name the enemy. It's a belief because we pretend that our enemy is our friend, Saudi Arabia. So what would I do? 
What would I do to Iran and Saudi Arabia? Well, you'll have to wait until after the break. Um, by the way, if you want in on the conversation, 888-900-3393, 888-900-3393. When we come back, I'll tell you what I would do with Iran and Saudi Arabia, uh, how I would deal with them, and how we could end this, uh, this terrorist uh, disaster that is plaguing the, uh, the West. All right, you're listening to Iran Book Show on the Blaze Radio Network. We'll be right back. This is the Yaron Brook Show. All right, you're listening to Yaron Brook Show, and and if you're enjoying the show, uh, I'm going to be on this week uh, for nine hours. Uh, I'm filling in for Mike uh, Pelka on the Blaze Radio Network on Tuesday, Wednesday, and Thursday. So Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday on theblaze.com slash radio between 9 to 12 uh, Pacific time, 12 to 3 uh, East Coast time. So I hope you'll join me. I hope, uh, I hope uh, y- you can uh, handle nine hours of the Iran Book Show uh, in, in one week plus the two hours this today. That's 11 hours. That's crazy. All right, so... We've identified the enemy. We found its financial source, fountainhead. We know where its ideas, the inspiration comes from. They come from two places, Iran and Saudi Arabia. So what do you do? Well, you certainly don't cut deals with them. You certainly don't pretend that they're your friends. You identify them. You declare them as enemies. And in the case of Iran, you either, you either, fund an internal revolution to overthrow the theocracy or you go in there and you crush them and you replace the regime there and you don't pretend to bring them democracy you know if there is a pro pro freedom real opposition there who will change Iran in fundamental ways you hand it over to them and if there isn't I like to say you give them the infrastructure their philosophy deserves and you leave them alone I don't believe in sticking around and building democracies and, and all of that. But as long as the regime, the, uh, the, 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 the uh, theocracy in Iran exists, we will continue to have terrorist activities all over the world. And not only that, there's no question in my mind that they are seeking an atomic bomb. They're looking at North Korea and they're saying, look, the United States is crippled by these guys. We need to have what they have. We need to have what they have. And we need a bomb. And they, they, they're working on it. They're working on it. Hush, hush. While, you know, uh, uh, inspectors go and they look and they look in the wrong places. And one day, just like with North Korea, we'll wake up and they're, they're, they're testing a bomb. And they will say, whoops, how did that happen? I mean, we had great inspections, and we had sanctions, and how did that happen? It's going to happen. And then what do you do? Then replacing the regime becomes impossible, or almost impossible. Right. Now, so that's, so that's um, uh, Iran. If you do that properly to Iran, all you have to do is turn around to Saudi Arabia and say, hey, Saudis, you want that to happen to you? Okay, here's what you have to do to avoid it, royal family of Saudi Arabia. You have to stop funding any advocacy of Wahhabism outside. There's no more funding of mosques, no more funding of madrasas. No money leaves Saudi Arabia in support of anything that looks even remotely like it might radicalize anybody. You just zero dollars out. You, you want to invest, you want to do this, fine. But you do not, do not fund the radicalization. You don't fund terrorist groups. And if you do, we can get a different royal family. You know, the only reason the Saud family rules uh, Saudi Arabia is because, uh, you know, that was the family the British decided on after World War I. They can be replaced. And, and 
neither Iran nor Saudi Arabia has even a fraction of a, of, of a military capability to touch us, right? And, and, but we're doing the opposite, right? We're selling them weapons, 350 billion worth of weapons. And, and Obama just keeps, uh, Obama, because there's no difference, right? Trump keeps selling them more and more and more weapons. Right? So you got, you got to identify the enemy and destroy him, crush him. Now, once you do that, it will be like the fall of the Berlin Wall. Not, not quite. It'll be like the Soviet Union disappearing in terms of a funding source and in terms of spiritual inspiration. They will have been shown that A, the West will stand for what it believes in. That it will fight. That they have no chance of winning. Because we have the firepower to eviscerate them. They will be shown that their pathetic leadership has no chance no chance of standing up against the West. They will dry up financially. Now, will there still be one-off terrorist attacks here and there? Sure. But it will be nothing as compared to what is coming unless we do this. Nothing. You have to crush the enemy. You have to humiliate them. You have to make it clear to them unequivocally that they cannot be successful, will never be successful. There is no path towards a caliphate. There is no path toward victory if they continue on the path that they're on. I mean, look at ISIS. ISIS had territory. And what are we doing? We're chipping away at the territory slowly. Why didn't we just crush them? It should have taken a week. Why does Israel tolerate Hamas? Why does Israel tolerate Hezbollah? These organizations need to be crushed, eviscerated. And are there going to be civilian casualties? Yes. Yes. We have to accept that and move on. Because otherwise, we will have civilian casualties. And by the way, they will have them too. Do you know how many people have died in, in, because of terrorist activities in the Muslim world? Hundreds of thousands. No attack the United States launched that actually crushed these regime, regimes would actually save lives. Because fewer lives would be lost, even in the Muslim world, from terrorism. So it is our own weakness. It is our willingness to identify the enemy and to crush it, destroy it. And I'm not talking about these little cells all over the place. These little cells don't exist without a spiritual guide who is funded by one of these countries without inspiration, which they get from ISIS, from a caliphate of Saudi Arabia, from Iran. They don't exist without that. You have to understand the psychology of a terrorist. Terrorists do what they do because they think they will win. Because they believe their cause is a winning cause. Because they believe that they are going to be rewarded because one day there will be a caliphate that dominates the world. Two minutes. Our job, our job is to prove to them that that will never, ever, ever happen. That all that terrorism will lead to is more death and destruction of their own people. And if you do that, terrorism will disappear. And you will save more lives by doing it once and for all, even in those countries. So-called collateral damage will be smaller if you do it and just get it out of the way rather than putzing around with no strategy shooting a few people here, doing it a little bit there, and, and, and emboldening these people to, 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 to just grow their terrorism and increase their dominance. You know, what's going on in Iraq and Syria is unbelievable. And we are doing One minute. nothing. Nothing. Right? Until you go after the, the Saudis and the Iranians, nothing will change. Nothing will change. Uh, and you have to go after them. And that would be probably enough. That would probably be enough. I mean, the, 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 the Egyptian military can take care of their own problems. Uh, the philosophy, the Dirty. ideology will become less popular, just as it was less popular before 9-11, less popular before 1979. All right, you're listening to the Ron Brooks Show. And uh, we'll be back. 
to talk about why we're so weak after this break. The Yaron Brook Show. All right, so uh, we spent the last hour and a half defining the enemy, uh, explaining why we don't have a strategy, and uh, giving an alternative. And, and I'll tell you, when I go on the road and I talk about these things, I often get standing ovations. I mean, people, are, people respond positively to the idea of crushing your enemy, of g- destroying them, of not just pinpricking them, of not just pretending, of not, not going into countries and being them democracy, but actually identifying the enemies, identifying the funders, identifying the inspiration, and, and, and destroying them. So why doesn't it happen? And somebody in one of the chats said, well, we are bad leaders. No, it's not our leaders. Our leaders are always a reflection of us. Our leaders are a reflection of us. You don't get leaders you don't deserve. Germany, in many respects, deserved Hitler. Right? We deserve the leaders we get. We vote them, we applaud them, we celebrate them, whether it's Bush, whether it's Obama, whether it's Trump. These are our leaders because we chose them. So what is it? It's something cultural-wide. It's the fact that our culture is bought into a morality, an ethical code, secularized both on a religious side and on a secular side. A religious code that teaches Self-sacrifice teaches humility. Who are you to stand up for yourself? Who are you to, to, to make a decision about who, you're, who is right and who is wrong, who is evil and who is good? Who are you to fight without any hesitation against what you decide? That's pretty selfish to, to define an enemy and to crush him. It is this morality of self-sacrifice, of humility, of altruism, of placing the well-being of others above self. So we, we drop food packages as we're dropping bombs in Afghanistan. This is under Bush. We have lawyers with our troops, so God forbid not a single civilian might die. We don't practice war anymore. We practice social services. We go in with whole organizations of the army dedicated to bringing good life to the Iraqis, building them sewer systems and schools. But, but, but we can't kill anybody. We can't destroy anybody. And we certainly can't declare. We certainly can't declare our values are superior. Our values as right for human life. Our values as right for, for, for successful human life. For anybody of any race, any ethnicity, any geography, any place on the planet. We need to be able to declare that, but that would be very selfish of you, Your Honor. How do you know what's good for other people? Well, history teaches us that. And reason teaches us that. If you just think, if you just look, if you just study, it's not that hard. But we are so meek, we are so weak, we are so... And I think because we are being so meek and weak, and we, we, some people responded to Donald Trump's you know, we're going to crush them, we're going to do this positively. Even though it's completely shallow with no basis and he's not going to act on any of it, right? But, but Americans responded against it because for so many decades we have been taught that, that to sacrifice ourselves for the sake of the meek of the earth, the meek of the world, for the sake of the suffering in the world. And who are we to assert ourselves? And you saw that. George W. Bush appeasing Islam immediately after 9-11. I thought he was weak from day one. He wouldn't name the enemy. He wouldn't call them who they were. And then he starts dropping food packages on them. Operation Iraqi Freedom was the name of the operation. The invasion of Iraq. Not Operation Secure America. Not Operation Save American Lives. Operation Iraqi Freedom. Because we have to do something good for them. They're the standard. We're not the standard. That would be self-interested. They're the standard. Altruism, this idea that other people's well-being is what is important in life, is what animates you in life, 
and that you have no right to your own life and therefore have no right to stand for your own beliefs, to stand for your own life, to defend yourself properly. That is what is killing this country. We have no self-esteem. We have no courage. We're weak. We're pathetic. And our leaders reflect that. We're humble. Humility is supposed to be a virtue. Why? I am proud to be an American. I am proud of the fact that I live in a free country. I am proud that, that I live in the place that the founding fathers created on the principle of individual liberty, the, the greatest political principle in human history. I'm not humble about any of that stuff. And if somebody wants to take my life, I'm not humble about my life. I'm going to defend it. I'm going to protect it. And many Americans, I think, respond positively to this, but we're so pounded by from our preachers and our philosophers and the media about how we're nothing special. And that even if we are special, we need to bring love and light to the world. And we can't assert ourselves. You can't assert ourselves as an individual. Certainly as a country, you can't assert yourself. We must love our enemy. We must turn the other cheek. Again, whether in religious terms or in secular terms. No. It's time we discovered an alternative morality. Keep going back to this theme if you listen to the show. We've got to start respecting our own lives. We got to start valuing our own lives. We got to start having esteem for ourselves. We got to start being self interested, not stupidly in a sense of just doing whatever your whims want or whatever your emotions want and just acting out. No, rationally pursuing as individuals. And therefore, because as individuals, as a government, as a state, we have got to start pursuing the interests, our own interests. What is good for ourselves? Now, I'm all for America first in foreign policy. If I thought Donald Trump understood what that meant, I would, yeah, that would be huge. But he has no clue, and neither do any of the people around him. And I'm not, I'm not going to tell you why I think Donald Trump has no clue, but the people around him, because intellectually, how do you justify America first? You have to understand what America represents. You have to understand why those ideas are superior to any other ideas. You have to be able to identify the ideology of the enemy. And then you have to be willing to act as if you're self-assured, self-esteem holding, rationally self-interested human being and defend yourself properly instead of cowering before your enemies, instead of appeasing them and negotiating them with diplomacy, which fails every single time, and yet we continue to pursue it. And, and you say, oh, that was Obama. Obama did it with Iran, but look at what's going on with North Korea. Put aside what are the military options. We can discuss those another time. But everybody in the administration continuously talks, well, uh, you know, Trump says this stuff. What's really happening behind the scenes is that there's diplomacy going on, even though it's failed every single time it's been tried with the North Koreans. No self-esteem. No self-assurance, no confidence in oneself, no self-interest, no ideology of self-interest. That's what we need. We need to reject altruism, and we need to start embracing the idea that individuals should pursue their own well-being rationally. And therefore, as a collection of individuals, which is what the country is, the government's job, the only job of our government, is to protect us and to do a damn good job protecting us. That is to go out there and fight on our behalf against what are our true enemies. And we, the people, must demand it. Otherwise, it will not happen. All right, we're going to take a break. When we come back, we'll wrap this up and uh, maybe talk about one or two other things. You're listening to your own book show on the Blaze Radio Network. So here we are. What we need is a strategy to defeat 
the Muslim threat, the Islamist threat, the terrorist threat, a strategy that crushes the enemy, crushes the funders, the inspirations behind these cells that are in Europe and in the United States. But to do that, because it ain't happening, to do that, what we really need in this country is an ideological shift. We need a revolution in this country. A revolution that rejects mysticism in all its various forms. Whether it's, it's uh, the, the, the mysticism of Islam or other religions, whether it's the mysticism of uh, uh, racism or the mysticism of the proletarian or the mysticism of emotionalism, which is so dominant on the left. And an embrace of a principle our founders understood that our decision should be based not on emotion, not on revelation, but our decision should be based on reason to everything. Bring, bring before reason everything. We must look at the facts. We must examine the evidence. Make decisions based on the evidence, based on our knowledge of history and the world around us. Not on wishes, not on whims, not on prayers, but on facts. And then we need a revolution that is about the individual. We need a revolution of individualism. We need a revolution that adopts a new moral code, a new revolutionary moral code that the author Ayn Rand wrote about in Atlas Shrugged and in other books. The Virtue of Selfishness is a book you should all be reading. The Virtue of Selfishness. A revolution about how we think about our own lives. Our life is not here to be sacrificed. Our life here is not to serve others. The meaning of our life is not to give and give and give. We should live to make our life as individuals the best that it could be. We should embrace who we are as human beings and develop our own capabilities as individual human beings and focus our attention on how to make ourselves the best we can be and develop the self-esteem, the self-confidence that comes with that and then elect leaders who will protect us because that's the only thing we need from our leaders. The only thing we need from our politicians is protection. And they're not doing a very good job at that. We need police. We need a military, a judiciary. But that's it. Protection. And in, if, if those leaders have an ounce of the self-esteem we as individuals would gain, then they would crush our enemies without a second thought. They would do whatever was necessary to defend the lives and property of Americans. Whether it's in this war or any other war of the future. But today, altruism has led us to appease, to compromise. It has led us to have no confidence in ourselves, to be, to be weak. It has weakened us because that's what altruism does. It causes you to question yourself. You question your own value. It causes you to feel guilty about pursuing your own happiness when there's so many miserable people about the world. It causes you to feel guilty when you bomb your enemy out of self-defense, but you feel guilty about it because there are people who are suffering there. Altruism is the enemy, and the only solution is reason and egoism. And until we embrace those, we won't have capitalism as an economic system, and we won't have a foreign policy that stands up for ourselves. All right, I've got like two and a half minutes. Two quick things. Good news. Uh, well, one good news, one sad news. Um, the, the good news is that Bannon is out of the White House. I am very cool with that. I'll talk about that next week. Uh, he's, he was an economic nationalist. He was the worst kind of uh, influence on Trump. Now, you know, who knows what influences Trump, but, but I'm so glad Bannon is out. I was rooting for him to be fired, and I'm glad he was fired. Um, you know, hopefully, hopefully, uh, Trump can surround himself with saner, saner advisors who are less nationalistic uh, Two minutes. and less focus on the on the evil of of trade finally you probably heard in the news uh that uh jerry lewis died now <laughs> you know it, it, it should make you smile when you when you hear the name of jerry lewis i i grew up with jerry lewis movies when i was a little kid I used to watch them, I guess, when in the 70s. I used to watch a lot of his old movies, him and Dean Martin. 
I, I, I thought in those days they were incredibly funny. I have to admit that I went as an adult and I looked back at those movies. They seemed incredibly silly. And, and, um, and, and I really uh, disliked them. But, uh, but I, you know, I enjoyed them when I was a kid. Uh, he, he caused me to laugh a lot. Uh, I think he inspired people like Jim Carrey. I don't think Jim Carrey would be Jim Carrey if not for Jerry Lewis. You can see Jerry Lewis all over. One minute. Uh, Jim Carrey's acting. I think he, he, he inspired many of the comedians and make us laugh today. Um, you know, again, I uh, enjoyed him less as an adult than as a kid, but I have fond memories of sitting in front of the television late at night, watching one of his movies, rolling around in laughter. And finally, I'll say this about Jerry Lewis, a fact you might not have known. Everywhere Jerry Lewis went, he carried in his briefcase a copy of the Fountainhead. He had the Fountainhead 30. close to him at all times. He was a huge Fountainhead fan. Uh, and if you haven't read the Fountainhead out there, go read one of the greatest books ever written. 20. An inspiration, and not just to Jerry Lewis, but to, to, to thousands, millions of people. All right. This is it for the Iran Book Show for this uh, f- for today. Listen in uh, during the week. I'm filling in for Apelka. Five. We're on the Blaze Radio Network. Talk to you next week.